Hello, this is Mike Swanson. This is a new segment of the Past American Century. We've got a very special guest with me tonight. I'm speaking with Carmine Savastano, the author of Two Princes and a King, and the, and the uh, runs the website tpac.com. Uh, How you doing today, Carmine? I'm doing good, Mike. It's good to be back. Yeah, thank you. It's been a couple weeks uh, since we last spoke, and you've got a really interesting uh, topic uh, that you want to talk about, and that's a, someone that's been a figure of interest uh, for many people interested in the history of the U.S. intelligence community, uh, the Kennedy era, and that is uh, the famous, uh, maybe infamous, uh, CI director that was fired uh, by Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs named Alan uh, Walsh Dulles. Yeah, yeah, Dulles. Well, he officially he resigned. <laughs> People people say he was fired, but he and he effectively he resigned. He was asked to resign. So take that as you will. It's he was gotten rid of because politically he needed to be because he had caused such a problem. And we talked about not him specifically, but some of the problems inherent in uh, covert operations, the Central Intelligence Agency in particular, uh, that, you know, Kennedy had Arthur Schlesinger study the problem of this, and one result of that was Alan Dulles was fired. So people should go back to the last video, uh, too, to get some of the background. But right now, we didn't speak about Alan Dulles at all, really, just in glancing, but this is we're going to really focus on him now. Yeah, well, I think a lot of times people will cover Dulles, but they only cover the later years. They don't, and and they, you know, he's aggrandized in a lot of accounts. A lot of people, you know, go to the media or they go to, uh, um, shall we say, favorable sources that want to build him up as some sort of, you know, monolith of intelligence rather than the more real human being who he was. Um, so you know, let's. <laughs> to get into it, uh, as Mike stated, Alan Welsh Dulles is a controversial figure of the Cold War history, and he certainly is an influential and overestimated figure of American intelligence. Uh, it can't be debated that he possessed influential family ties, resources, and had a path to power laid before him, but I would note that Dulles is not the master of spies that some might believe, and certain important events in his life demonstrate he is many things, but a mastermind is likely not one of them. Well, I, just by coincidence, uh, I'm finishing a book about World War One and Woodrow Wilson, mm -hmm. and uh, Alan Dulles was in France during uh, the Versailles Conference, and he was about 25 years old and was operating as an assistant, like a clerk basically, to the Secretary of State at the time, who is Robert Lansing. Now, what's funny though is Robert Lansing was his uncle, <laughs> and he had and, and Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles. They had a grandfather uh, named John W. Foster, who had been a Secretary of State, I think, in the 1890s or 1880s when they were just really little kids. So, uh, being into diplomatic service and having, you know, powerful, uh, you know older family members uh, at the top of the State Department. That's how they grew up. And really, the early career of Alan Dulles is as a State Department uh, clerk, employee. Uh, yeah. employee, basically. So uh, not like a super spy, kind of more like an assistant. And then uh, after World War One in the 1920s, uh, he went to uh, Switzerland and worked in the embassy there um, and I'm looking uh, and then he actually went and got a job at Sullivan Cromwell a, a, an important uh, law firm uh, in New York City that has all these Wall Street um, a, a Wall Street uh, clients famous law firm but he was really a, a State Department kind of diplomatic official not uh, a really a super spy, uh, yeah. as people would think. 
Yeah, and uh, and I know that during that period, during 1922, uh, he became uh, the State Department's Near Eastern Division Chief. And he completed a law degree in 26, and like you said, he kept serving in State Department uh, capacities, and he was, uh, yeah, the U.S. Uh, China delegation. He was a counselor there, and then he relocated, uh, as you said, with his brother to that New York law firm. Then the war breaks out. Oh, one thing... I I didn't tell you. Like uh -huh. I mean, now, it's popping in my mind. It's been six years ago. I, I read, I think, two biographies about him, and one of the things I remember reading was he got into law. Him and both his, and his brother too. They both were partners in that law firm, and they wanted to make a lot of money. Oh uh, yeah. But once they got in there, and I think Fa his brother John Foster Dulles was a little bit older, rose up higher at the law firm. Yeah, uh, and Alan Dulles didn't like law. He didn't. Uh, it just was. It wasn't really interesting to him, and he wanted to get out of it as quickly as he can. And and my impression of him, and maybe we'll talk about. We'll probably touch on this later, but is that he's someone that likes to go to parties and and and, and socialize, um, and you know, be an operator in that sense, and not you know, go to the courtroom and make arguments or do the work necessary uh, to research a legal case. Well, I, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's a big uh, difference between the two brothers. Dulles, John Foster Dulles is the older, he's, you know, uh, more gruff, he's more hardline, he is a more traditional classic cold warrior that is very straightforward and very direct in his approach to things. Alan is more of a player. He likes to, as you said, carouse, and he definitely likes the ladies. And he likes to take part in the set rather than actually doing the work required. To you know, he he is uh, almost sort of like a favorite son, as we're you know, not to say that John Foster Dulles isn't a favorite son. He's the oldest, but John Foster Dulles was willing to stake more work and more time and deal with the tedium of, for instance, law to get what he wanted, as where Alan, like you said, wanted to hang out and get his name known. He was ambitious, but not so ambitious that he would do all the work that his brother would. Yeah, and both of them got involved in politics, um, in, in particularly in the Republican Party. And the Republican Party back then is not like the Republican Party today. People think of Trump or something, or that the Republicans are super conservative or something, but... Yeah. Back at back then, more the like Repub George H. W. Bush Republican Party. Yeah, but well, it was there were kind of divisions in it. But yeah, there was this big, uh, kind of uh, uh, in uh, the northeastern establishment Republican yeah. Party, that, and that's what they were linked to, which tended to be, I guess, the equivalent. I mean, it's hard to even. The Nelson Rockefellers guy in the 1960s. Yeah. Rich were, Easterners. Yeah, the Eastern establishment, so to speak. And But they were interventionists. They wanted to intervene. Uh, in, in the 1930s, they were writing articles. Basically, uh, Alan Dulles was writing articles uh, basically saying that the U.S. Uh, would have to, you know, get involved in Europe if there was another war. And then once the war broke out, he was a strong advocate of the U.S., you know, getting involved in Europe. Uh, and at the time, the, Re the Republican Party had a very big isolationist wing that didn't want to do that. Uh, so it was probably actually a minority uh, position, but maybe he was doing that also, wanting to <laughs> become a big player once the war started or something, too. Yeah, yeah. We, we see that, I think, you know, anyone who looks at, the Dulles brothers, you see them often positioning themselves ahead of the historical moments that occur. They, uh, you know, some people try to say that they have some sort of prescient ability, but that's not it, because you can see the mistakes later on that they didn't, at least Alan the Dulles didn't. Um, but you see that they position themselves fairly adeptly to try to benefit when a big political upheaval occurs. And the war was such a political upheaval. So, following the outbreak of the war between the U.S. and Japan, Dulles is recruited by William J. Donovan to serve in the Office of, Strate uh, the Office of Coordinator of Information in 1941. 
The COI was the earliest incarnation of later intelligence groups such as the CIA. Uh, Dulles is put in charge of the New York office. Um, a year later, Donovan creates the Office of Strategic Services, and Dulles is charged with leading its burn station in Switzerland. Now, this makes sense based on what Mike said earlier, that he was already serving in a State Department role there years before. So he already knows the ground. He's already familiar with some of it. So he, in a certain sense, he's probably just going back there doing the same old job he had before, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and this, too, is where we come into the people, the supporters and the detractors of Dulles who are trying to influence the public image that he has, you know. You know and during the period in Burn Station, he's credited with uh, uh, this operation called Operation Sunrise, which was an attempt to have enemy forces surrender before the official secession of hostilities took place. So uh, Dulles warmed to German offers to impede the Soviet Red Army's movements in Europe to allow other Allied forces to secure areas before the Soviets could. Ultimately, the operation accomplished little, but Dulles and his advocates publicly trumpeted his service in Europe as masterful. Mm -hmm. However, later research offers that Operation Sunrise was mismanaged by Dulles and should have never been undertaken. According to multiple authors, Dulles attempted to make the deal with German leaders because he did not have much to show for his time in Bern. Indeed, some believe the legend that was being crafted of Dulles' success, but his actual record was average and not quite so impressive. According to historian John Kenneth Galbraith, a secret negotiation process between English and U.S. officials that cut out the Russians commenced, and as Winston Churchill assured Stalin these Italian area forces would be contained, Others plan to release them into selected areas. This would bring unwanted attention to the American intelligence establishment and incited the Soviets, possibly contributed to the spark of the Cold War. Perhaps most foolish of all was the German ranking officer Dulles met with, Karl Wolf, did not have the authority to conduct diplomacy, and Wolf was resting comfortably in a mental institution's month after the war. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So he was basically negotiating with a Nazi madman. <laughs> <laughs> who didn't have diplomatic authority to conduct these uh, these talks. And that was trumpeted as a success. Well, did anything come out of Operation Sunrise at all? I, I'm sure that, you know, maybe they got some sources. But ultimately, uh, you know, a couple – there were surrenders of some forces a day or two before, a few days before. But it wasn't the big – and, and they never were able to redeploy them to the areas that they wanted, or at least there's no documents yet that show that they were able to do so. So ultimately, it was a grand idea that wasn't executed properly with the right person, because it also was be with Wolf instead of someone who actually had the authority. Mm. And then what happens after that? Um, so, well... So those, you know, in the in the like I said, in the public, you had a bunch of people trying to make Dulles' service appear very impressive. So those defending his preemptive action stated it was an astute gamble that anticipated future Russian aggression, but this feasibly was just another attempt to distinguish him. Um, while he may be called a practice self-promoter, skilled diplomat, practiced attorney, even an intelligence administrator of note. Dulles is not a proven master spy with limitless insights. He certainly is not the mastermind that some claim, because several attempts at gaining power, as we will see, he failed at. And when he desired prestige, most of the time he didn't get exactly the prestige he wanted. Um, intelligence leaders don't just conceal their identities, I think is worth noting, but or, or their plots or their motivations, but Sometimes they conceal a rash and inept style of management that others try to massage into a legendary status. So, right. Yeah. So while Dulles was attempting to fail his way to power, <laughs> his brother John Foster Dulles was succeeding as a Republican advisor uh, to U.S. Democratic President Harry Truman. Now, this is after they've made their established place in the Republican Party, as Mike said, as long-term advisors and members of the Republican Party. He is going across the aisle and he is uh, a counselor to Truman, and he is also going across the aisle, like Mike said, to fight against the isolationist Republicans by making friends with some of the Democrats that were pro-war. 
So he was actually trying to institute more anti-Soviet, or not anti-Soviet, but uh, yeah, well, I mean, eventually we were getting into the Cold War area, so he was basically one of the first Cold Warriors, calling for things before anyone else did. Um, uh, so John Foster, Alan Dulles' older brother, he wanted to engage the Soviets on nearly every front and roll back their domination of Eastern Europe. He called for the U.S. Uh, in the post-war era to support Chinese dictator Chiang Kai-shek and to start additional proxy wars that became later U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, uh, that, that, I would say that's in contrast to the so-called containment policy. Uh, yeah, which, which Truman well, used. Yeah, that was Truman's official policy, and that asserted basically that we won't let communism advance, uh, but if we can just hold it off where it is, in time it would crack under its own contradictions. But the rollback policy was different. It stated not only will we contain communism, but we will try to uh, flip. Uh, communist countries where possible, uh, so try to free the so-called captured nations of Eastern Europe, uh, liberate uh, China from communism once once uh, Mao took over, and other parts of, of Asia, uh, and, and so forth. So it was a much more aggressive uh, Cold War policy, yeah. or, or at least it, by appearances. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I think it, it's interesting, in one of the prior episodes we discussed it a little bit when one of the CIA deputy directors was commenting on it about Korea, and I think it's applicable in China and in the other proxy wars we've talked about, is that we were, quote-unquote, liberating it from the desire of a majority of the population. Like in China, the majority of the population were peasant communists. That was most of the people. It was Chiang Kai-shek and his forces in the cities that were nationalist. So, I don't know if it's liberation so much as putting puppets into control <laughs> so that we can make them do foreign policy according to our will. <laughs> Similar to Mozambique and the Shah being put in, in Iran. Well, that's become, when you look at situations like the Shah at Mozambique, then it, it, it's a question of what is a communist and what isn't, and they have a slippery definition of what who a communist is. Uh, at that point, it's almost whoever is against some of our oil friends or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that yeah, and I think that that's one of the big problems with probably every country's national policy is that there are, and we see that now I think in modern politics, you know, not necessarily along these lines, but along doctrinal lines of that each side follows, you know, Republicans and Democrats. You, you see that people don't adhere to the actual definition of things sometimes. And for political purposes, they then stretch it, you know, kind of like with the Red Scare. The communists weren't the problem alone. It then became the people who associated with the communists and then the people who associated with those who, asso you know, just until it's everybody. Until basically anyone who disagrees with you is the enemy. And that's a problem. <laughs> that's a, a very tribal thinking that we can't allow ourselves to fall into and when we do that's when we see some of the biggest historical disasters and I, I think that also contributes to the nepotism that we see sometimes in you know not just in intelligence circles but in government circles the Dulles, the Dulles brothers are a perfect example you know they come from a long line of State Department high officials and as where John Foster is willing to do all of the tedious work he allows his younger brother to fail his way into success by using his influence, as you know, we'll see. Um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, one of the things that John Foster Dulles in the period called for was uh, using the words unleash Chiang Kai-shek uh, and starting the additional proxy wars, and Alan Dulles shared in these visions of a militaristic future guided by clandestine intelligence akin to his days in the OSS. It's interesting because John Foster Dulles was a State Department employee, but he kind of had a very military thinking to dealing with the communists. Um, during 1948, the U.S. leadership commissioned a report by three American officials, and leading this trio of assessors over intelligence was Alan Dulles. 
He and the group offered several criticisms of the CIA and its leadership, namely Director Roscoe Hillencoder, for some legitimate and many unreasonable claims. Among the legitimate claims was the CIA's failure to prevent itself or its operations from gaining significant public attention. However, it was Dulles and people like him that promoted intelligence operations in the media and used the press for advantage that had brought media attention to the intelligence circles. Thus, it was not Hillencoder, but Dulles and other self-promoters that drew this unwanted investigation of their operations by the public. And they continued to release press stories. So even as they were attacking Hillencoder and the agency for talking too much, they were talking too much. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I think that it's possible that Dulles may have used his appointment to remove an impediment on his path to CIA director. It's current director Hillencoder. I think that the first CIA director, you know, it's true that he, you know, we've talked a little bit about him in some of the other episodes, was growing tired of internal fighting among the civilian and military departments. Mm -hmm. And he might have even been willing to step down if certain assurances had been made to him. But nobody bothered to ask. So as greater influence and reproach came to bear upon Hillencoder and the CIA, much of it unreasonable, he was replaced by President Dwight Eisenhower. Right. It, now, instead of the ambitious Dulles, Eisenhower chose the stern and imposing General Walter Bedell Smith. Smith and Dulles could not be less alike. While Dulles lounged in burn glad-handing, Smith was on the staff of General Eisenhower gaining a reputation for not taking nonsense from anyone. Smith quickly redesigned the agency and its structure along military lines and improved the organizational uh, works that had malfunctioned under prior leadership. Smith is interesting, and uh, I'll send, I'm going to send Mike references to attach to the episode. Uh, it's got the CIA historical structure, and I think I discuss it in my description of Smith. But one of my favorite stories about Smith was he, uh, on his first staff meeting. Well, he, it, I, it, I'm sorry, let me ahead. ask you real quick about yeah. Smith. If I remember correctly, during World War II, he was Eisenhower's chief, chief of staff. staff. Yep. Okay. I just want to interject that. Yeah, and well, and and you can see his military. He never he he was a military man every day. He was in the agency. He like I said at his first staff meeting when he got together all of these uh, diplomats and people who would probably be more akin to uh, analysts and uh, officials that have had their their positions for quite some time largely unchallenged. He came in and said, "It's going to be interesting to see how many of you are still here." <laughs> After I do some assessments on you. <laughs> <laughs> so he opened his first meeting with half of you are probably going to get fired. It's <laughs> <That's> funny. <laughs> Very Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Yeah. <laughs> in his management style. <laughs> uh, but and it probably happened. Oh, yeah. Oh, I have no doubt that he cut tons of people and then replace them with other people. And one of the big things that Smith did, uh, and, and you'll be able to read more about it in the reference, is that he redesigned everything. He instituted the directorates that still exist in the CIA today. Though they've been altered you know, in various instances, they still are basically in the same structure, and they use the same system that Smith set up. Because one of the problems in Hillencoder's time that he really couldn't address because of the infighting was how exactly reporting would occur, the actual structure of the CIA, who reported to who, how, you know, I mean, because there was always fights about, you know, and you and I have talked about this off the air, Mike, that the State Department and the Department of Defense basically wanted to control the agency. And they were maneuvering for control, and by doing that, they weren't allowing it to have any sort of stable structure and you know, set doctrine of what they were supposed to do and how they were supposed to do it. So Smith basically outlined all those things. He constituted all of these portions of the agency that had just been in existence but weren't really acting in unison. They were all doing their own thing. That sounds like a mess. Yeah. Oh, it was. <laughs> and still is, I'm sure, in certain areas. 
but that I mean, would my you know again, it's been six years since I've read about this stuff, but my memory is that Truman got very angry uh, before Smith was put put in place there. That what happened was China fell, and uh, Stalin exploded an atomic bomb. And the Central Intelligence Agency had been telling him that they would not be able to explode one of these atomic bombs for for a while, for years. And then they did it. Uh, and they didn't foresee that uh, Mao was going to have his victory in China. Uh, so he saw these as huge intelligence failures. So if they can't give him the upper hand on what events are coming down the pipeline what function do they have uh, so he wanted to shake things up uh, and what I remember is Smith when he got over there uh, charged tasked with doing this they went and looked at what is the intelligence information they're actually giving uh, Truman you know this presidential Actually, they didn't have the daily presidential brief uh, that I think that actually started when Kennedy was president, where there's a piece of paper, you know, given to the president. I don't think they even had that uh, yet. But uh, what they discovered was that these guys weren't really doing anything except reading newspapers and just, you know, putting stuff together based on that. And there wasn't any real deep analysis uh, going on. Uh, so, so it was like a joke. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was open. So they were using a lot of open source material and probably some classified stuff they could get their hands on. But yeah, largely it was it was disorganized. And yeah, some of that was Hillencoder's fault, but a lot of it wasn't because he couldn't effectively organize things because he had to go through the Joint Chiefs and the State Department and uh, the President to get things. You know, I mean, the President, of course, ultimately was the executive, so they were the ultimate power that everyone would report to. But the State Department and the Department of Defense wanted the CIA to report to them, and then they report to the president, as where, when it was constituted by Truman, there was no in, in between. There was the CIA director reported to the president, or he went through, of course, you know, uh, the, the Joint Chiefs in the State Department, but he, they, they were there for an advisory role, not a control role, and they wanted control. And mm. Helen Coder was fighting them half the time, so he didn't really have the ability to focus on making the agency as organized as it needed to be. So do you think then that Alan Dulles was trying to undermine uh, him with the idea that he could one day become the director and, and change it in a way that suited uh, – that would give him more power than, than was originally uh, constituted in the CIA? I certainly think that's possible. I certainly think that if all that is true, at minimum, he saw Hill and Coder as, I called it earlier, an impediment to his path to the director's chair. Hill and Coder was, Hill and Coder didn't want, as where Dulles and his older brother John Foster embraced this militaristic vision of proxy wars, Hill and Coder didn't want the CIA to be used as some sort of tool to basically undertake all the wars the military wanted to undertake without having to take the blame. He saw it as an intelligence and analysis group. And then the military could undertake all those guerrilla operations on their own. Which in a certain sense, uh, you know, during World War II, they did. You know, I know the OSS yeah, that's what was the OSS there. Was. Yeah. But... I mean, I know the OSS was there, but uh, in, in many cases, it was really the military doing more of this guerrilla stuff than, than the OSS during the war. Yeah. Well, yeah, because they didn't want – some commanders didn't want to let them into their theaters. They wanted to control everything. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> but ultimately, that's all it was. I mean, it was just – it's all these internal arguments and egos fighting over who gets to go and kill the enemy. Because <laughs> interesting, life, like uh, Douglas MacArthur, you know, the commander in the Pacific, 
uh, of, of the, the ground forces, and there's of course uh, Nimitz was huge egos. Yeah, well, but MacArthur he had his own intelligence chief. Well, actually, we did a show about him uh, or a segment. General Willoughby, Charles Willoughby. Yeah, yeah. And and he kept the CA out so he could do all this stuff himself. Yeah. Uh, so when uh, when the war was over, MacArthur uh, occupies Japan. Willoughby is there, you know, doing the intelligence stuff, and not the OSS, not the CA, but uh, and so forth. And and interestingly enough, in the in the fifties, uh, this General Willoughby puts he gives information to people like Douglas MacArthur. I mean, not, not, I'm sorry, uh, Joseph McCarthy, uh, that to say that the CIA is full of Reds and they're incompetent, and they're the reason why. Uh, China fell and and so forth and so it's kind of kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's almost like an extension of the infighting. It just kept going on. People had made political enemies and they just kept hitting them where they could. You know, using the existing structure. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and unfortunately, Bedell Smith, for you know all of his uh, forward thinking and strength, did not anticipate the. Uh, or you know, uh, you know, maybe as we'll get into in a second, maybe it was just a dipl- it was a diplomatic move. But so during the 1950s, Smith appoints Dulles, Alan Dulles, to the position of deputy director of plans, and then deputy director of central intelligence. This cements Dulles's credentials. So now he's got all of his State Department passed. He's got his OSS service. And now he has been director of plans, deputy director of plans, and is deputy director of central intelligence, second only to Bedell Smith himself. Mm. And under uh, his super, under Bedell Smith's supervision, the agency with Dulles's involvement overthrows the Iranian government of Mohammad Mossadegh in 1952. Smith decided or was convinced to become Under Secretary of State in 1953, and Alan Dulles, with the help of his older brother's influence and his ability to form political alliances, becomes Director of Central Intelligence in 1953. A year so, later, the CIA aided the overthrow of the communist-friendly government of Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala. Well, maybe we should talk about the 50s and the 60s in a follow-up episode. Sure, sure. Make I think that's been... part one, and then we'll do that as part two, because we kind of laid the background of these two figures, and then we can talk about the famous operations or the, the operations that made them famous. Uh, but I think they're actually already important figures. I mean, they're funny because um, – 30 years ago, um, if you read books about U.S. foreign policy, the Cold War, their names didn't even come up that much, even though they were so important. I mean, uh, and now maybe their names outshadow most people of the time, of that era. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that it's for better or worse in some cases because they are important figures and they certainly deserve mention. But a lot of people give them more importance than they necessarily deserve, at least Alan Dulles, if not his older brother. You know, John Foster Dulles was a very important figure, and Alan Dulles was important. But I think some people think of Alan Dulles as some sort of mastermind spy, and he's not. He's, yeah, he certainly doesn't seem to be like a James Bond figure to me at all. Yeah, yeah, he's not the sort of, well, and even, you know, as we'll get into next episode and just from some of what we've discussed with his time in the OSS, even when he had the opportunity to shine as an intelligence operator and administrator, he didn't. Mm. So I, I just think it's, a, it's an improbable assumption to think that later on he suddenly became a mastermind when all of his life he was, like I said, in a lot of instances, failing his way to success. <laughs> well, we'll keep to hold that thought, and we'll do a uh, part two, and uh, so people can well attach that video 
when it's ready to to this one. Uh, but it might be a week, you know, or something before that second one's up. But people will be watching this, you know, months after we do it. And so I'll edit the the link below once the second one is ready and uh, and make it in there in with your uh, supporting uh, materials too. Great. Yeah. No. I hope everyone enjoyed themselves and I. I think that it's important to lay the groundwork and offer some of this information that usually goes unnoticed for the more spectacular things that happen later in his career. Definitely. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me and everyone else, and we'll talk again soon. Okay, I'll talk to you then, Mike. Take it easy.